Right. Um, I'm going to talk to you this evening about the building stones of the Yorkshire Dales. Um, this was um, a project called the Strategic Stone Study. Um, it was some time ago now, but the geology doesn't change and the um, buildings, the historic buildings don't change. So all I'm going to say is still valid. This project was 2011 to 2012. It was led by English Heritage, working with the British Geological Survey, local geologists and historic building experts from each of 35 counties in England. Um, and the idea was to do all of these counties. Um, they paid consultants to do the job and it was meant to take six months, but a lot of the consultants were unwilling to do what had to be done in six months, especially for Northwest Yorkshire. So I was approached to by my brother-in-law who was running the project for British Geological Survey and they almost begged me to do the Yorkshire Dales area. So, but they gave me a lot more time because I was at that time working full time as a quarry manager. And um, so this was all my weekends and evenings in 2011 to 2012. Um, the idea of the project was to establish the main types of local building stones used in each county as a guide for recommend recommendations for repair work. Uh, basically to inform um, the planners who quite often stipulate using local stone, but they don't actually really know what the local stone is. So the idea was to go through each county and um, identify the uh, main types of local building stone and to allow for the potential sources of stone to be recognised and safeguarded for conservation. My area was Northwest Yorkshire, which was most of North Yorkshire to the A1 and which took you about to the A66 and across to Sebra. So it was quite a large area. Um, we were given a geological map with quarries from all OS maps published and any other sources that BGS had already um, at their disposal. So they gave you quite a lot of information. Um, all the grid references were on um, a spreadsheet, um, as were the grade two listed buildings of which I learned very quickly there's a huge number in the Yorkshire Dales in the area that I was in. Um, so at, at the beginning it actually had look at all grade two listed buildings but I was allowed to take all out because it would have been impossible and would have taken much more than two years. It would have taken 20 years I think to look at every single listed building in the Yorkshire Dales and Northwest Yorkshire. So also, if possible, establish the quarry that supplied the stone. That came down to looking at the quarries from the map that we'd been given that were in the same rock uh, group and putting a variety of sources down on the spreadsheet because very little has been written down. In some, some cases, um, it has been written down and where the documented evidence was easy to obtain, then we knew which quarry it came from. But for a lot of the um, buildings, it had to be educated guesses, really. But the idea is to look at the stone anyway. So the quarries that were in that stone were likely to have supplied the stone. Um, this is actually a simplified geological map. Um, and although there looks to be quite a lot of detail, um, most of it, the Yorkshire Dales is, is carboniferous and you can forget about some of the detail that's on here. Um, around Ingleton and Horton, there is some older rock, which is Ordovician and Silurian. And I'll, I'll go through that in a few minutes. Um, whoops, right, I've gone. Let me just go back a minute. So the, to the, and up into the northwest of the area over 
to the east of Richmond, you're actually into uh, Permian and Triassic and Magnesian limestone. Um, there's only a very small amount of that in my area. So the, most of it was actually Carboniferous, but we are going to, right. And this, <clears throat> just to show you that the Carboniferous is a little bit more complicated than just Great Scar Limestone and sandstones and shales. The, the geological map on the left-hand side um, is around, is Upper Wharfdale, that's Buckton Pike up here. Um, down at the bottom, you have, well, the middle limestone it shows there, which is here. So at the, ve the very lowest, which isn't on here, is Great Scar Limestone. But then you quickly go into the uh, Yordale series, which is all of these here. In Upper Wharfdale, there's very few sandstones in the Yordale series that were actually prominent enough to be used for building stones. But if you look at this geological cross section here, there's loads of sandstones. And for reasons that we don't really know, the people who mapped it named, I think because the prominent rocks were limestones, all the limestones um, are named, but most of the sandstones aren't. But when you actually go into Wensleydale and Swaledale, if you have a look around, despite the fact that most of the rocks that you see prominently are actually limestone, most of the buildings are actually sandstone. In, well, from Kettlewell North Woods, you start getting the Yordale series sandstones mixed in, but because around Buckden and quite a lot of the Dales, Kilnsey and places, the limestone is more prominent than most of its limestone. That's the general idea anyway, but um, I'll go, I'm going to go through um, the rocks and give you a geological tour really of the Yorkshire Dales. So we'll start with the oldest rocks. They were Ordovician, 480 to 443 million years. Um, they occur in small outcrops around Ingleton. They're mainly very hard, gray green, turbidite sandstones and siltstones. Turbidite means that it was actually mixed rather than um, flat bedded. Um, the exhibit slated cleavage in some areas and there were slate quarries in and around Ingleton and they were used for slates in the local area. And also you can see them in the rubble, rubble stone used in the building, but they weren't actually a major building stone. So we'll have a look at the building. Well, the quarry, that's one of the quarry, um, Ordovician slate quarry near Pecker Falls, Ingleton. So that's the type of rock that they actually used <coughs> for the roofing slates. This is a slated mansion in Ingleton. And you can see they're actually quite um, thick slates and quite rough, but in the buildings around Ingleton, they are quite common. Because they're very heavy slates, they didn't travel too far from Ingleton, but in that area, you can often see them. This particular house was an example of many grade two listed buildings that somebody has covered up the stone so you can't see it. So we can't look at the stone that this particular building is made of. So we'll go into Ingleton Village and this is one of the oldest houses in Ingleton also I'm told. This gentleman very proudly showed me and he would actually have taken me inside to see the remains of the thatch of the um, from the thatch roof in his attic but I had already spent about 20 minutes with him and had I spent an hour, then my chances of doing all the buildings that I meant to be doing that day would have diminished somewhat. But if we have a look at the stone, there's only a small amount of, that's a closer view, there's only a small amount of the Ordovician rock there. The rest is limestone, bits of sandstone. And also if you look, a lot of it is rounded, which means they've probably come from either glacial deposits or the river, probably the river 
the rounded ones, it probably quite a lot of stone in some of these buildings wasn't actually quarried at all in our sense. As the same, this is Bank Hall Ingleton, and that's again typical of the rubble stone that you see in Ingleton houses. You do have the Ordovician um, are here, these dark coloured ones, but there's also sandstones and limestones. And these rounded ones have probably come from the river. Where there's a major river, it was often used as a source of building stone. Right, we'll go to the Silurian, which is 443 to 420 million years ago. This is found in a restricted area around Sedborough and Ribblesdale. The sandstone, siltstones and mudstones, these are generally parallel bedded and they give rough slabs for building and paving stones. The dark blue flags or ragstone in both groups, plus paler coloured ragstone. Um, the word ragstone isn't actually a geological term, it's more a building term and it actually means that if you try and cut the rock at um, 90 degrees to the bedding, it won't cut in a straight line. It gives a ragged edge. And I'll give you an example in a minute. This is Sedbra um, Church, Church of St. Andrew. Um, it's a very old church, mainly 15th century, uh, 1500 and restored 1886. If we look a little bit closer, again, quite a lot of this stone probably came from the river or from glacial deposits because it's either angular or rounded. It certainly doesn't look like it's quarried stone. The sandstone used for the windows is very rough. They haven't even managed to, like most windows, they'll try and get a large piece of stone across here. And the same here would be minimum numbers of pieces of stone, but they've had to join the stone because the local stone was only available, sorry about that, oh, just a minute. The local stone was only available in relatively small pieces. So it's quite a poor quality sandstone that is found in the close proximity. We'll go into Sebra. This is Memories Cottage on the main street in Sebra. You can see the different colours here. Um, this, the because this is sort of flagstone, it actually is very flat stone and quite thinly bedded. Um, most of what they've got here, they've managed to break more or less at right angles, but not all of it. Some of it is um, very ragged at the edges, but they can course it. And another example there. And here, you see that now I'm skulking about the back streets, and that is because if you look down the little passageway there, you'll see that the main street in Sebra, they've whitewashed every building. And I think that's mainly because it's such a dark rock and it can be quite oppressive on a very um, small street. So a lot of them are whitewashed on the top. So you've got to go down the back to actually look at um, the rock that it's made from. Um, the local, because it is a flaggy rock, you can see above the windows, the drip courses are actually flagstone and around the chimneys as well. Um, but again, and they have managed to find some big enough for coin stones here, but they give very ragged edges here along the side. Some of almost, I'm almost angular, but they can't guarantee that it's actually going to break that way. This is, as we, they got into the Victorian times, this is 1848, um, they started to saw the stone and it became more regular, they could easily course it. And also they became a little bit more artistic and started using the different coloured rock to a decorative effect. Here, this is Sedba Reading Room, um, obviously a prestigious building. Now, because um, 
it's a little bit later, they've actually brought in sawn sandstone, probably from the north to the north of uh, of Sebra from Rothay Quarry in Old Oldale, I think. Um, and that's a much higher quality sandstone than we saw in the church. So we'll go back to Silo in Ribblesdale. Here there were large quarries in the blue flags. The flagstone was easy to split along the cleavage, but difficult to, to shape. In the 19th century, cutting and polishing facilities at Helwith Bridge, Sunnybank, Arthur and Studfold quarries were available. And much stone was exported from the valley for clapper bridges and flags. Today, the only quarries in the area are for high fric friction road stone. But this is Helwith Bridge quarry as it is today. It's actually used for fishing and is flooded. This is Helwith Bridge um, Hamlet, really. It's not really a village, but you can see they used the flagstones for everything. They used it for the walls, they used it for the gate posts, they used it for the steps, they used it for the houses. But I do have to say that these are the most dismal houses that I've ever seen. And I actually was there in rain, so they looked even worse, but they're so dark. Um, but these were the quarry workers' houses, so they didn't really have a choice. If you look at the coin stones here, it really demonstrates the nature of the ragstone because they've broken very unevenly when they've tried to actually cut it across the flag. Um, so these were probably, because of the workers' houses, they didn't really pay much attention because it does look like some of them they have sawn there. But it's actually very arduous to use this stone for building stone because the flags are so thin and you need so many courses to actually build a house. This is uh, Westview Horton. The side of the house is similar, but the front is sandstone. And this is actually near the railway line. And it was probably, the sandstone was probably brought in on the railway. Um, this is the church of St Oswald's with the views, the uh, blue flag for the paths and for the seats in the porch. And for the, this is the crown, the actual lower part of the crown is built of limestone, which if you know, know Horton at all, you'll know that the limestone is actually above the flagstone. So they have used the uh, limestone as a building stone of choice here. And then the upper extension probably was after the quarries were open because, oh, sorry. It's a bit sensitive. Um, they've actually built the upper extension from the um, flagstone. So go to the next. And um, the Church of St. Mary Ingleton, this is blue flag sleep. Uh, seats cut and polished in the church. I'll go back to the stone above it in a minute um, because it is rather special. Um, this is the Clapper Bridge at Malham, which is probably 18th century. And this is Dry Rig Quarry, um, which is now an aggregates quarry, but was originally um, a flagstone quarry. Now, as we go up in the geological record, there should be the Devonian, but we don't find Devonian rocks in this area. I think there is a small amount around Sebra um, that is a, a conglomerate, but it wasn't used as a building stone. So we go straight from the Silurian to the Carboniferous. That's 350 to 300 million years ago. It overlies and overlaps the previous rock types. It's characterized by thick sequences of limestone, sandstone and shales. And in the west and central area of the Yorkshire Dales, it's a massive limestone, traditionally known as the Great Scar Limestone. Above the Great Scar Limestone lies a cyclic sequence of limestone, sandstones and shales, which means the cyclic sequence means that's repeated. So it'll be limestone, sandstone, shale, limestone, sandstone, shales. Um, and then on the very top of the hills, you get the coarser um, sandstones of the Carboniferous. 
in the western area, the close proximity of the Ordovician Silurian and the Great Scar Limestone can be seen in houses along the edges of both rock outcrops, for example, Ingleton, Horton, Austwick, Clapham and Faser. This is, we're going back to Ingleton Church here and taking a closer look at the limestone that it's made of. It is basically a carboniferous limestone, but it must have laid almost directly on top of the Ordovician because those pebbles in it are of the rock below it. And again, looking at um, Seed Hill Ingleton, which is the one we saw earlier, the coin stones are actually made of a similar type of limestone, but with larger pebbles in it from the Ordovician. So this particular rock must have must have been quarried directly, the limestone directly above the Ordovician. Um, here, this is Lee House Austwick. Again, it's mainly limestone, but it has Ordovician rock scattered in it. And here at Austwick, it's the upper extension that is Ordovician or Silurian. They are very similar in this area and it, it could have been either, but that's on top of the limestone, which was obviously the older building stone in this area. And again, a closer look at Phaser and a mixture of both rock types. So north and east of these areas, <coughs> the Great Scar Limestone covers large areas. It's generally massive and difficult to work. Um, several villages stand on this bedrock, Malham, Kilnsey, for example, but it's only rarely used as a sole building stone. It's more often used as a rubble stone with sandstone dressings, often slobbered or rendered so the stone can't be seen. It's rarely used as squared stone in prestige. It's rarely used as squared stone, but can be used in prestigious early buildings or expensive later ones. Frequently, uh, sandstone from above is used for coins and window dressings. This is a very um, popular view of Kilnsey. Um, one of the things um, I want you to look at as well here is that the fields look, um, well, they're just grass, which is quite common, but Kilnsey itself, um, the rock was shaped by two glaciers that met coming down the valleys and scored out under the rock. That actually left limestone scattered along the whole of the valley on top of the boulder clay. And in some places, I haven't got a photo actually, but if you actually look, if you're traveling from Skipton um, towards Threshfield on your left-hand side, uh, in the fields there, the fields for some reason have never been cleared and there's still scattered limestone blocks all over them. Um, they would have been scattered across here, but they've obviously been used for dry stone walling and other building purposes in the past. Um, this is the old hall at Coniston. That is mainly limestone with sandstone dressings. Again, from Coniston, if you go up onto the top, Starbottom Fell or Buckden, the top of the hills are, um, of course, a grit stone. And this was often used for the, um, around the doors, above the windows, and for coin stones. Also um, for the gateposts here. Uh, this is Friargarth Farmhouse at Malham. Again, because limestone is prevalent, then it's been used mainly as a rubble stone for the building and sandstone coins and window dressings. But note, this probably is collected from the fields as well and broken rather than quarried because it is very angular and broken. This is a bit more prestigious. This is Kilnsey Old Hall, 17th century. It has been recently restored and I would suspect that perhaps, well, this stone up here is definitely 
new stone that has been brought in from somewhere else and has been cut. I don't know, because I didn't see the building before it was restored, but if you look at the stones that make the windows, they're instead of one big piece, which if, the, if there was good stone that you could cut into a piece like that, they would have used it for the windows. Like there is an odd one here that's just one stone. All the others they've had to um, make out of two or even three stones, which suggests that the sandstone that was available to them wasn't um, very uh, big block, wasn't obtainable in very big blocks, but would have been quarried. That's quarried stone. Uh, this is St. Leonard's Chap uh, Ch uh, Chapel, Liddale. Um, Again, it's been restored. Um, it's limestone rubble slobbered with lime mortar. This one, slobbered means there's more mortar than stone, basically. And sometimes if they've slobbered it too much, you don't see the stone at all. But it is quite easy to see that the stone here um, is limestone. But again, limestone is very difficult to build with, which is why they put so much mortar on it to try and seal the walls. Um, this is cell side, um, squared limestone rubble. This, it's actually quite a posh building here because they've tried to course it and um, they've chosen probably from thin beds, which you do get some thin beds of limestone at Horton Quarry. Um, that can be used as building stone, so, but would have been more expensive. But over the porch, it's just rubble stone. At the ends, it's just rubble stone as well. So they'd use the more expensive build uh, stone for actually fronting the house. And here again, sandstone coins. Again, quite rough really. So suggesting that the quality of the sandstone isn't brilliant really. So the lower Carboniferous limestones were different in nature to the north and south of the area, being massive limestone to the north and well bedded with mudstones to the south. So main control on the geology of the Dales is the presence of the Askerid block, and that's bordered to the south by the Craven Fault system. And south of the Craven Fault system are thick beds of limestone and mudstones. And Hetton, Ayrton, Kirby Mallon, Broughton, Rillstone, Coniston Cold, Burnsill, Appletewick, Skipton, all stand on these limestones. But they were actually, um, because they were interbedded with mudstones, sometimes they could provide um, ease, um, better shaped stone for buildings. But if there's sandstone close by, it won't always be the building stone of choice. For example, Burnstall and Appletrewick and Skipton as well, their, their building stone was usually sandstone, um, but there are some examples of building built from the Craven Basin limestones. This is one of them, Manor House at Carlton. It's limestone with sandstone lintels on coins, but you can see it is from thin beds which were actually provided better building stone than the Great Scar limestone to the north. These ones aren't quite as square. This is Yeoman's Cottage Kirby Mallum, which is a bit closer um, perhaps to the grit stones, but some of the rubble stones looks quite rounded as well. So it's likely it could have been picked off the fields, moved by glaciers. Um, and again, they've got the sandstone lintels and coins from a better uh, deposit than the limestone. This Viepoint house, it's obviously quite a posh house here. So they bought a nice bit of sandstone in for their date stone. Oops. Sorry. It's, here we go. Um, they've brought a nice bit of sandstone, but also some good sandstone for the coins as well. 
sorry about this people. So uh, this is Ayrton Mill. This is early 19th century. Um, and this is a very good limestone for building, uh, squared limestone and sandstone with coarser sandstone coins, but they still mixed in some of the sandstone, which might have been available from the quarry close by as well, but the coin stones are definitely from a different source. So we go to the Yordale group, which is a younger part of the Carbonif Carboniferous, and the stone changes in character, and so the building stones change as well. Um, we saw on that cross section at the very beginning um, that the Yordale group is characterized by numerous alternations of sandstone, mudstones, and limestones. The sandstones were often discontinuous, but are the most important building stone in the Northern Dales. Some have very thin beds, but were strong enough to be quarried as flags and for roofing slates. This is a vicarage at Kettlewell. It's refunded and extended, which probably means that we can't guarantee that the window dressings are local, but certainly the coin stones um, are, and the main building stone is the characteristic orangey gray color of the Yordale sandstones mixed in with limestone as well. Um, this is Cotterby Scar limestone above and Burtdale Beck with a waterfall which is running over sandstone beds here. And this might not look like a quarry, but it's almost certainly has been quarried in the past. This is a type of um, stone that you get out of it and it was the waterfall was probably here originally it's very easy to divert the water to one side take some stone out here divert it to the other side and take some stone out and rivers where um, where the stone was good and could be used as building stone were often used as quarries in the past again here you can see um, this is from Reith Bridge. You can see limestone quarries at the top of the hill and the sandstone here beneath. It's highly likely that the limestone was actually used for kiln rock rather than for building. If sandstone is so close by, then they'll use sandstone in preference. So the Yordale sandstones are usually fine to medium grained often rich, iron rich with a distinctive orange color, often tinged with gray. It can be quite decorative with swirls of orange st staining. Where they find grain, they have a conchoidal fracture similar to limestone and are often parallel bedded. So they provide a stone easily broken into square blocks. They found in the Northern Dales, Wensley Dale, Swale Dale, Dent Dale, and sandstone can be of variable quality houses are often slobbered or lime washed. This is um, Gale Sandstone Mine, courtesy of Dave Carlisle. Um, there was a lot more sandstone mines than you think in the Yorkshire Dales. Um, and prim primarily they were actually quarried for the sandstone slates for the roofing, but they also often took this quite a lot of blocky stone here that's been used for these pillars. So they would have, one of the quality of the um, Yordale sandstones was they could often chop it and it would cut at right angles. So it actually made quite a good building stone. This is Forcehead Farmhouse Gale. Um, this is squared sandstone from, um, possibly from the mine or it could have been they were often quarried first and then mined afterwards. Um, you see the characteristic colours of the Ordales, very orangey and grey. Um, it's a sandstone slate roof as well, which is probably local and a drip course, which is from quite long pieces of sandstone slate. So it was obviously very good quality sandstone slate close by as well. This is a church of St. Oswald Asgrid. This is an older um, 
building. It's originally 15th century with alterations later. Again, it has it's more rounded stone, but it has the characteristic colours of the um, Yordale sandstones. And again, here, the Yordale sandstones and slates. And a close up of Gale Methodist Church, this is 19th century, Yordale sandstone. These are actually known as Isengang rings and they are very decorative where they're found um, like this. They can also be used as art in artistic ways. This is the Temperance Hall at Bainbridge. And this is one of the cottages, many cottages in Dent. Again, the characteristic orange and gray colors of the local stone. This is a national school at Dent. Unfortunately, when this sandstone is actually used vertically, it can be quite flaky. So it's not always quite as good 200 years later, well, 100 years later as it was when it was put in. So it can, can be quite flaky, but it's very good when used as a building stone in horizontal layers. This is Hilltop Quarry near Raven Seat. Unfortunately, it actually um, ceased work in 2010. It was still open for the locals to use for repair work, which is quite good because the family said um, that they didn't mind if people wanted to go and help themselves. Um, this, this is actually near Amanda Owens farm up at Raven Seat. And another quarry that is actually still working um, this is Whittenfell Quarry. This historically provided stone for Jervo Abbey, which was built in 1156. And it is, this is one of the thick limestone beds. It's very good Whittenfell um, sandstone. It's a medium grained buff coloured carboniferous sandstone. Um, it's been used for quite a few uh, prestigious buildings and it is available as a local stone, but because it's fine grained, well, medium grained, it can't, it isn't the same as some of the local stone, but it is the best that is now quarried. Um, so we'll look at the Yordale limestones. It was occasionally used as building stone, especially where it was coarse grained. And crinoidal limestone was especially useful as it had a characteristic similar to coarse sandstone. It could be cut into large blocks and were used to build several of the large viaducts for the Settle Carlisle Railway and many buildings in Middleham. It was also used as a decorative stone and polished to make marble. This is East Lodge, Bolton Hall, Wensley. The front of the um, building is very nice, dressed limestone with sandstone coins. If you venture around the back, however, this is the more local stone, which is uh, Yordale sandstone and limestone rubble with coarser sandstone coins, but that gives you a better view of what um, the local people would have used to build their houses. And here, this is St. Andrew's Church, Dent. Um, it's mixed Yordale sandstone and limestone rubble on the outside. We can see the sandstone there and limestone. On the inside, it has got some of the best um, dent marbles that are still around. Um, these are from the Hardro Scar limestone and the Simon Stone limestone. And even more if you look there. So it's definitely look worth a visit. The red limestone in the center I think comes from Kent, somewhere near Kendal. This is actually um, Dent Head Viaduct. It, they built one of the pillars in a marble quarry. And this is actually a marble, but it doesn't look like a marble. You have to actually go very close up to it because from a distance, it just looks like gritstone. But because it is a crinoidal limestone, it is um, quite granular 
and behaves like um, it behaves like a coarse sandstone. So this was built from partly from hard scar limestone and partly from Simon Stone limestone because they were quite close together in this area. Um, this is Middleham Castle. Um, it's a mainly a crinoidal limestone with sandstone coins. You can see the sandstone running up the edge of here and round the windows. And that's a close up of crinoidal limestone. So you can see how granular it is and how it enables um, the rock to be cut um, in three dimensions, basically. So it creates quite a good building stone. This house, again, from a distance, looks like it's gritstone, but it's crinoidal limestone from Melmaby. So above um, this is the Richmond Church series, which is lower millstone grit. And in the north, the cyclics, it continued longer and it became more churty with crinoidal limestones and good beds of sandstone. Richmond Castle shows a wide variety of material available locally within its walls. Uh, Yordale sandstone from the bed under the underset limestone on Askmore was brought, brought down to build the 12th century keep. And a close up, you can see what a good building stone this was. And, but the whole of the castle isn't built of this. And these are the churty colored red limestones from the Richmond Church, which were also used. And side by side, um, sands, a grit, sort of coarse sandstone and crinoidal limestone. And again, um, this thin bedded sandstones from the Ordale group used for the arches and poor quality churty shales used for the infill. This is crinoidal limestone and is probably where the um, limestone came from for the castle. Um, because again, it's a tourist spot now, but once was a quarry and it's quite easy to see how the stone was actually quarried from here. So we go higher still into the millstone grit series. Um, which overlays the Yordales in the north and the older limestones elsewhere and is a sequence of sandstone mudstones with very occasional limestones, which is the millstone grit series. These beds are found topping the higher hills above the Yordale group and were often brought down either for whole buildings or for just coins and lintels. This series is prevalent to the south and east of the area and contains many good building stones. So, although the word millstone grit conjured up for many of the coarse grained pebbly sandstones of Grassington and Brimham, some of the beds were much finer grained. Around Skipton, the pendle grits lay below the coarser Grassington grits. The coarser stone was the preferred stone of the Cistercian monks and Norman lords, being easier to cut into large blocks. And the pendle grit was also used as a building stone, um, as the box was smaller and easier to handle. This is Beamsley Hospital. Um, the main building is Pendle Grit with Grassington Grit for the door surrounds. Um, and if you look at the main building, it's well, we're now on the grammar school, but that's the same, it's a bit closer. And you can see the pendle grit with Grassington grit used for the coins and lintels. Skipton Castle, again, um, Skipton Castle itself stands on limestone, but the coarse grain Grassington grit was brought down from MC Moore as the larger blocks were easier to cut and work with more primitive tools. These are the quarries that they're thought to have used for Skipton Castle. Um, you can see the plug and feather marks still on the edge of the blocks here and here as well, which is the coarse Grassington grit or Wally Wise grit as it's sometimes known now. And the Church of Holy Trinity 
again stands on limestone, but is built from Grassington grit from MC Moore. And as well, one of the characteristics of this is the red sandstone as well from MC Moore, which you can see in places today. And in MC itself as well, you can also see the red sandstone. Um, many of the bridges built across the wharf and the air were built from large blocks of Grassington grit, especially after massive floods washed several bridges away in the 17th century. Uh, Church House Grassington, coarse grain Grassington grit for the door surrounds and windows with finer grain sandstone and odd pieces of limestone in the rubble stone. So again, because you're actually closer to the limestone, they have used some as part of the building stone. And into Nidderdale, um, most of the building stone, with a very few exceptions, are from the Millstone Grit series. Uh, the use for dams at the top of the valley and all the villages, the various beds provided good stone. Sandstone slates from flagstones were also quarried. These beds provided medium to coarse grain sandstones and grit stones, some containing small quartz pebbles. This is Scar House Dam Nidderdale, built from red scar grit with Carfell quarries in the background. So here we definitely know the quarry that it came from and we can see it in the same photograph. Um, this is the old sweet shop in Pateley Bridge, built of coarse grained lower brim and grit from above the town. And then here is the Crown Pateley Bridge, it was originally built from Lower Broom and Grit, but it was rebuilt 1767 using smaller blocks of fine grained Libyshore sandstone, which was quarried on a larger scale later in the 19th to the 20th century. This is what remains of Scottgate Ash Quarry, which in its heyday was one of the largest quarries in Yorkshire. And this, as this letterhead actually shows. And one of we're now going to the very northeast of the area um, where Permian Magnesium Limestone actually occurs within the area I was looking at. It lies above the millstone grit sandstones and forms an abrupt almost north-south junction with the underlying sandstones. Where they both occur together, they, provide, they both provide good freestones and either can be used and sometimes they're used together in buildings in villages such as Massam and West Hanfield. Here is a sandstone um, used for Massam Primary School. It was rebuilt and enlarged 1834 in local gritstone. And in the same village, you get um, 17 the square built of magnesium limestone, very distinctive. And St. Nicholas Church, West Hanfield, was originally built of Laverton sandstone, which you can see in the tower. Um, but the nave was refaced with magnesium limestone in 1860. So both these sandstones are, well, sorry, both these building stones are seen together in the same building here, one magnesium limestone and the other Laverton sandstone. So basically, um, we're looking at a lost industry because despite the hundreds of quarries in different rock types that once existed, there's only one working building stone quarry in the Yorkshire Dales today on Whitton Fell in the far east of the Dales. Horton and Ribblesdale quarry is actually an aggregate quarry, but it also has one bed of thinner limestone that can be sold for building stone. Magnesium limestone can still be obtained from Hivemore Quarry, Tagcaster or Caveby Quarry, Doncaster, but it can't actually be obtained within the area that I was looking at anymore. Gatherley Moor Quarry near the A66 in the north of the area, um, it quarries uh, a sandstone. It's just been given permission for a 2.7 hectare extension which is roughly the size of three rugby pitches. Um, that's for a quantity of stone for 50,000 tonnes over 20 years, which actually gives an amount per year that we would quarry in less than a week 
um, when I worked for Curlstones Quarry. So it's a, a very small extension and is unlikely to be used for local building stone. It's more likely to be sold for prestigious buildings because it's actually owned by um, a large quarry company here near Doncaster. So the vast majority of buildings in the Yorkshire Dales could not be matched from these quarries. And most of the local sandstone used in the Yorkshire Dale today is sourced from reclaimed stone or from West Yorkshire quarries. So in conclusion, the building stones of the Yorkshire Dales are very varied and reflect the geology of the local area. This is best seen in older houses which characterize the villages and was quarried locally, where more than one stone type was available. Different stone types were often used with stone for specific purposes brought in from as close as possible. But ironically, we seek to repair old buildings with local stone, but in many areas, no local industry now exists to produce it. Um, I'd like to dedicate this talk to my brother-in-law, Dr. Graham Lott, who led the project for the British Geological Survey and who talked me into doing it for this area. Um, he's, um, but he sadly passed away last July. Um, so, and the results of the strategic stone study for all counties are available on the internet. So if anybody wants to look at um, the atlas, then this is the, um, that's the link for it. You can also find any of the atlas, atlases for the other 35 counties in England that were done. So thank you very much everybody for listening.